right. It's been a while since I've done something like this, so we'll see how it goes. I've been having a lot of thoughts, unsurprisingly, but uh, maybe the most recurring thoughts are about the state of the tech ecosystem and how that kind of plugs into larger society. Maybe the better way to talk about this is to say that I feel like we're at a turning point in history. And that's almost certainly like because of how I started in tech. I started about a decade after the dot-com bubble. And that was in 2010. And it was just a few years after the whole subprime mortgage crisis, the financial crisis. And what kind of happened is that the few survivors of that initial dot-com bubble crash, and then the survivors, and then once they survived 2008, they became very, very confident. They developed a feeling that they were kind of unstoppable, right? Um, and the surrounding economic circumstances also kind of changed. We moved into a different paradigm entirely. Um, the Fed decided that the best thing to do was just to keep cutting interest rates. It was the first time in my life that you could get a 0% interest loan on a car. So it was, you know, the, the wonderful year 2008, all these banks are going under, the insurance companies, all these, um, what were considered stalwarts of the private sector were going under and the Fed decided the best way to deal with that was to get consumers to just go out and spend again because we were addicted to spending. And America is a kind of interesting country in this example because the American dollar doesn't work like other dollars. Uh, doesn't work like other currencies around the world. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because I think it is tied to the tech ecosystem and how your startup gets funded. All these things are linked up. We live in a world where how you and I eat, what you and I eat, has probably touched a thousand different hands, right? Um, and so many people are responsible for so many different pieces of our lives. Um, and we can't simply you know, ignore the greater backdrop, the macro behind the very micro of what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. So you have this like strange complex. There's falling interest rates, which means cheap capital. If you have a lot of money, you can borrow some more money very easily on top of that. And most importantly, I think relative global peace. Um, what happened recently is, look, it's, it's September 2022. And right now, the Ukrainians are rolling into areas that have been held by Russia for the past few months. On February 23rd of this year, very few people in the West were saying that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. It was simply thought to be unreasonable. And, and even when this happened in 2014, people were like, oh, it's a, it's a minor inconvenience. We'll, this will go away in a bit. But that didn't actually happen. Um, so this, these past few months have been very confusing. But the previous... 12, 13 years, they're even more confusing because they were a sort of island of peace in an otherwise unstable history of our world. They were this time when money was cheap, interest rates were low, and you had all sorts of weird companies come up as a result of that. Now, what I want to talk about this, when I, when I want to talk about this, I want to talk about this in terms of what we lost because even though that sounds great, look, we have peace, we have prosperity, we had all these things, what we actually lost was the counterfactual. There was a unique moment to have built technologies that would have been incredible for the common good. And instead, we got a bunch of these visionary CEOs whose visions were just kind of crazy. Um, and not good crazy, just crazy crazy. And of course, Trying to tell the difference between good crazy and crazy crazy is a very hard job. And I don't, you know, um, I, I'm not trying to insult the um, skills of venture capitalists out there. There are plenty of people out there who can do that. Um, I want to just bemoan what we lost. I want to grieve for what could have been. And out of that grief, I hope we find a better plan towards what technology can be and what capital can do with technology. So one of the big things I, I will, terms I will use over and over is techno capital, which is that right now, we only really think of technology progressing at the behest of capitalists. That is people who have a bunch of capital to deploy, throw it at engineers, they create a technology and that's, that's how things move forward. This is, I think more of a myth than anything else. It is a PR move. Even within the current AI world, you can see 
there are companies like OpenAI, and then there are projects like Stable Diffusion, where open source efforts are able to recreate what capital does in a very efficient manner, um, meaning just time and resource investment. But that word techno capital is important because it helps us describe a group of people uh, with certain characteristics, certain incentives, and a very particular vision of the future, which in my mind is very underspecified. The, perhaps the biggest weakness of these techno capital CEOs like Masayoshi Son of uh, of SoftBank um, is that they are vulnerable to all the diseases of ego that any human being is. And so when a visionary CEO comes along, like Adam Neumann, for example, of WeWork, these venture capitalists are often captivated by the story and the, even just the, the primal energy of people like Neumann. And I think that um, this is just because they're old dudes, you know, people get old, um, things don't work right anymore, you know, your dick doesn't get as hard, your knees start creaking, and uh, you start to realize like, oh man, I really wish I had that young man energy again. And look at this 35 year old, he's got a bunch of that energy. Um, and you start to do what human beings have done for a long time is you over identify with the con man. But we'll get to that in a bit, or maybe we won't. But there are, there's a spectrum here, you know, like Adam Neumann, I, I think is a complete fraudster. Um, but has along the way done, he's done something. You can't deny he, you know, he's, uh, that he's done something. Even turning, you know, I forget how much it was, like 15 billion of invested capital into 9 billion of, of you know, of value. Um, at least he didn't kill the company, you know, at least he didn't completely flush all of that money down the drain. But that's still a far cry from the value that could have been created by that money. Along that spectrum are also people like Travis Kalanick who sold ideas like Uber, which are logistics enabled businesses that only really work in the already degraded environment of American suburbia. They don't really fit into other societies very well. And when they do, they sometimes actually exacerbate what is wrong with the society. And Uber, I'll get to Uber, maybe I'll get to it, maybe I won't. Um, but I think Uber is a good example of a company that promised to be profitable but was built on such a uh, inefficiency to begin with that it is still struggling to reach that point of magical scalable profitability. And yet these are the CEOs who captured the imaginations of VCs. And it wasn't just VCs who were captivated by these things. Um, everyone, everyone was touched a little bit by the incredible intoxication of the surrounding environment of peace and cheap money. It just, it got to everyone. It got to all of us little by little, because as I think about it, everything you and I do in our day to day is linked ultimately to the macro environment. I think human beings are actually far more sensitive to the backdrop than we think. We're just, we're attuned to the backdrop. We, we sort of, we're like those noise canceling headphones. We are, we acknowledge our backdrop and then we sort of play a neutralizing tone to kind of cancel it out. But we're aware of it because we are producing the thing that like cancels out the backdrop. And so we all got kind of sucked into it. And I would say even, you know, Larry Page and Sundar Pichai and everybody who um, was anybody in, in the tech scene was pulled into this uh, regime of you know cheap interest rates and, and cheap money it's only human right like after all economists are the ones who are designing some of these incentive programs and they are giving us exactly what we want in order to pursue a particular type of growth and they were hey, look everybody can say we were just doing the best we could um, and, and they would be largely right um, they were just doing the best they could and um, and yet there's a lot better that could have been done I think what we're about to find in the next few years is that all the promises of techno capital, of uh, firms like SoftBank and the Vision Fund, um, of even the big tech companies, uh, was largely driven by throwing cheap credit into the furnace of the growth engine. And I think this is true of, say, some companies more than others. Uber, I think, is 
a classic example of burn cash for engagement and then um, eventually hope to like turn into a monopoly, blah, 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 blah. And that, that practice of throwing cheap credit into the furnace to keep powering that growth engine, um, it just it won't stand without that cheap credit part, right? And that's, that's gone away. Um, it's not a matter of it's going to go away. Like we are no longer in that low interest rate world anymore. If you go out to get a mortgage now, you're looking at a 6% interest rate. I refinanced my mortgage in January, it was 2.5, right? And those rates aren't coming back down. There's no conceivable world in where, where that's happening. And what was the most interesting is the CEO of Uber all but admitted that the business that was supposed to achieve this massive scaled up uh, success, um, that is like success once it has scaled up, um, it achieved scale, but it's not as profitable as they promised it was. And they're already starting to squeeze drivers uh, along the way. And I think just as, you know, Google learned this with Google Fiber, and uh, I think a bunch of companies learned this in the, um, in the 2010s, you can't just take your tech practices like agile and uh, um, you know uh, continuous uh, integration and somehow turn those processes into something that will make a brutal unit economics business run properly right or, or run in a fantastically profitable way it is not the practices of technologists that leads to their success um, it is that we work in a domain which is fantastically Full of I don't know just cool abstractions and things that get you tons of free um, just free work right it just it, it, the, the computer does a bunch of stuff for you it's not the practices we have that make our companies valuable it is that we are able to take that technology and apply it to particular problems in society and that's what makes it happen I, I think you could that there are certain problems out there that could have been solved with none of the traditional you know design pattern knowledge or um, agile technologies etc cetera, etc cetera, and they would make fantastic businesses right not using any of the standard practices but just because they are technology do doing what computers do best which is a bunch of rote tasks um, and and just throwing that at the problem so what what I'm seeing is this shallow you know cash driven um, growth, it had like this veneer of innovation. It looked like innovation. It had the looks and practices of technology and technologists, right? I'm sure people at Uber did standups and I'm sure people at Uber filed their bugs in a bug tracking platform. That doesn't make it a technology problem. And I think something else happened here is that that veneer had this strange retro futuristic gloss over it. It's almost like somebody in the 1970s like imagined what technology would look like. It's like, oh, you'll get a car that just kind of shows up to you um, and, and delivers you food and, and, and these types of things. And it feels very much like those 1970s space colony imaginations um, where uh, where you're like, oh, we'll all live on the moon and we'll go vacation on Mars. And those turn out to actually be really shitty things to do. Like, there's nothing to do on the moon, right? Um, there's not very much to do on Mars except die. And the, but, but the important thing is that a few people did believe this. And a few people are the techno-capitalists. The, the techno-capitalists of the 2010s, they were actually so inspired by science fiction um, that, that they, built these, they built these things that were straight out of, you know, an Asimov short story or were, you know, inspired by Philip K. Dick or, or Arthur C. Clarke or whoever um, was the sort of foundational bit of that. The, the, the thing is, many technologists become technologists because they read something in sci-fi and they're like, damn, this stuff is cool and I would like to do more of it. And then they finally got the chance to do that. They built a bunch of these inspiring things and they did it with little regard to the actual cash required to sustain these businesses, right? Forget that part because again, cash was cheap. I would say Elon Musk, um, who are, you know, like Elon Musk is somebody I don't care for very much. I think he's done like, he's done one interesting thing for every 20 really stupid fucking things that he's done. And so I don't see the love for uh, him. I'm also not big on hero worship. In general, I have a thing against like the Thomas Carlyle great man vision of history because I think it's lazy. Um, I do. I think it's not interesting. 
I think if you want to understand how societies and histories change, um, you can only get so far by reading about, uh, you know, this this queen marrying this king and this prince like getting uh, hemophilia or whatever. Um, at some point, you have to read about technology, right, and the actual movement and change in technology. And that is almost always a result of lots of different people getting together, not necessarily one heroic inventor going in and doing that, uh, going in and doing something that unlocks a bunch of um, progress. But the important thing is Elon Musk and whoever, you know, maybe I shouldn't pick on him, but whoever's the individual actually espousing the sci-fi future, like, yeah, that doesn't really matter. Anybody who's espousing that sci-fi future, what matters are that the material forces that motivated these folks to invest in these businesses, that, like, the thing that made them think that those impossible dreams are possible. Um, and then a different set of material forces which, like, made those impossible dreams seem like good business ideas, that's what we need to tackle. I think the low interest rates of the past decade have been a complete brain rot for everybody involved. I think they've not just like degraded our sense of what's valuable and possible. I think they've also just kind of, they've demotivated us. They've left us, I think, emotionally distraught because we want, we, 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 we want a little bit of struggle. We want reward, but we also want to know that we're building something enduring. And we all value work, like not just as a place for making money, like that's important, but when money becomes this sort of um, ubiquitous symbol, right? Um, devoid of all other, once we have no longer, you know, common metrics for determining productivity or, um, or even, you know, something as vague as technical coolness, uh, technical progress, money, making money um, just becomes this way for us to like connect to a larger sense of society. And that's a really bad way to deal with money. Money isn't really meant to be uh, a form of um, transcendental connection or a system of um, determining who has created the best thing. Um, money is a, it's a medium, right? It, um, you could easily end up optimizing for money and losing out on pretty much everything else. But I get ahead of myself. I think that we've lost a big portion of what work means because of the cheap interest rate environment. And I think that one of the fundamental things that actually gets people up and at work is because we, we, build, we build things because we want to help each other. Um, this is one of my fundamental beliefs. I think that I get up in the morning and I don't think about my salary. I don't think about a lot of things and I'm very privileged, right? Um, but I'm willing to bet that many people are not waking up in the morning and trying to do the calculation of how much they're earning that day. And they're not doing the calculation of how little they want to do in order to get away with making that money the most optimal way. If your base idea of a human being is someone always trying to maximize the value extracted for work put in, right? Then you'll drive yourself crazy. You'll drive yourself crazy because every day you'll want to do stuff, right? You'll go to work and you want to do stuff maybe because just because it helps your coworkers, because it's a nice thing to do, because you like hanging out with them because you like your project, because you want to get better at whatever skill you have. If you believe that you need to work as little as possible and make as much money as possible, then you'll optimize for a very particular set of optics that are going to make you miserable and will just kind of make everybody hate you eventually. So I'm fairly sure that a fundamental motivator of a human being since the dawn of time is this getting up, connecting to people around you and helping them out. And I think cheap capital ruined that. I don't think we always needed these visionary CEOs to help us figure out what we were trying to build. I think many people actually knew. I think when bricklayers were laying down bricks for a cathedral, they could imagine the cathedral in their head. They might have seen another cathedral before. They might have seen, you know, pictures of it. Whatever it was, they managed to actually get the image in their head and they didn't need someone to motivate them continuously. I think when we start relying on these people, when we start relying on these visionary CEOs to paint us these, these deep 
images were essentially led into games of confidence, where a company runs on the confidence in the central figure rather than the actual business underneath. Maybe that's how all startups work. I don't know, but I'm gonna take a pause here. Part two, some other time.